Hey, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you, and welcome back to Now TV, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. Sitting here kind of going over some of the material that I wrote in my book, The Last Days Identified. As I've shared with you for a couple of weeks now, here we are in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic. We have all sorts of so-called prophecy pundits uh, telling us this is proof positive we are in the last days. Just yesterday, I got onto um, I got onto a website, and the the writers on that website were just all over the coronavirus issue. They were assuring us, without any doubt whatsoever, that these things that that the world is experiencing right now is proof positive that the end is near. So far, I I have seen predictions that the end is going to be in 2030. It's going to be in 2050. Now, wait a minute. What happened to all the previous predictions that could not fail, by the way, we were told, uh, that the end was going to be in the 80s, 1980s? What happened to 2015? What happened to Y2K? What happened to 2012? You see, the prophecy pundits told us that all of those dates, and I've probably overlooked some, all of those dates that I mentioned were absolutely the time of the end. I shared with you a couple of weeks ago how I received an email from a gentleman who said that 2015 would without any doubt whatsoever. In fact, he said if the Bible is inspired, the rapture will occur. World War III will break out in 2015. Daniel chapter 9, 24 to 27, will be fulfilled in 2015, September, Rosh Hashanah. I responded to that gentleman. He was obviously sincere and devout. But I told him with as much kindness and respect as I could that he was wrong. There would be no rapture. There would be no World War III. You know, there would be no great tribulation. And I told him that after the date that he had set, and nothing happened, it would prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that his predictions were wrong. And I asked him to please contact me so that we could get involved in some serious, respectful dialogue. Well, as you know, 2015 came and went. The rapture did not occur. The Great Tribulation did not occur. World War III did not occur. Daniel 9, 24 to 27, in other words, was not fulfilled. And after waiting a good period of time to hear from him and not hearing from him, I sent him an email. And I said, I'm not trying to just simply say, I told you so, but I most assuredly did tell you that your prediction was wrong. Please let us enter into some respectful, cordial Bible study together. He wrote back and admitted that he was wrong. He said, I simply do not see how in the world I could have been wrong. I'm, now I'm having to go back. I'm having to recalculate. And I wrote back and I said, your calculations are wrong because they take events that were supposed to happen that Jesus said would happen in the first century, that his apostles said were near 2,000 years ago. You're ripping those things out of that historical context and you're applying them today and that's anachronistic and that's wrong. I urged him to please respond so that we could study. Well, here we are, 2020, and I have not heard back from him yet. I seriously doubt that I do. Listen, folks, when, pe when you hear people say the coronavirus is proof positive that we are in the last days, they simply are not telling you the truth. Let me recommend to you that you go to my website, donkpreston.com or bibleprophecy.com and go to the store and look up the last days identified. In this book, I go to every single text in the Bible 
in which the last days are discussed at any length whatsoever. I even examined many passages in which there's not a great deal of detail, but the details that we do have help us to clearly and undeniably define properly and biblically what the last days were. And yes, I mean what the last days were. Here's the bottom line. In this book, I prove definitively that when the Bible talks about the last days, it's not talking about the last days of time. It's not talking about the last days of the Christian age. The Christian age has no end. It is talking about the last days of old covenant Israel. And yes, in this book, I I discuss and I refute the idea and the claim, hey, look, there are no last days of Israel. Well, that's strange because Deuteronomy chapter 32, which is called the Song of Moses, is a song and a prediction about Israel's last days days, says it twice in the text. So here is a major prophecy, an eschatological prophecy, and it is emphatically and explicitly about Israel's last days. So go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com, order the book, The Last Days Identified. Now, it's normally eleven ninety five. dollars But if you will order the book and if you send me a note saying, Don, I saw your offer for the last days identified on Now TV, I will refund your shipping. Now, I can't make this offer for out of U.S. orders. Okay, this is for U.S. orders only. And, however, here's the good deal. If you live out of the U.S. and you would like a PDF copy of this book, at a greatly reduced price even, then contact me and say, hey, I I live in Australia, or I live in India, I live in Great Britain, whatever, okay, and I can't pay the shipping. I'd like a PDF copy. Send me a note, and I'll show you how to purchase the book at a greatly reduced price. Well, look, I've spent a couple of weeks now discussing the coronavirus and the proof that we are not in the last days, And that segues beautifully with our examination of the doctrine of what what I've been calling the challenge of Christ. Because, you see, Jesus said, if you will remember, do not believe me for my word's sake, believe me for my works. If I do not do the works which the Father has given me, do not believe me. Now, the works that the Father gave him to do was to come and to die for our sin, to be buried and to be resurrected. And Paul goes so far as to say, if Jesus was not raised from the dead, we are yet in our sin and we are hopeless. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 12 and following. So, here we have an absolute prima facie argument. Don't believe me, Jesus said, unless I do what I say I'm going to do. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be be crucified, buried, and I'm going to be raised from the dead. His apostles thought he was crazy. But he did it. Praise God, he did it. And because of that, he has become both Lord and Christ. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Why? Because he kept his word. Okay, consider then, once again, as by way of refresher, that Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, you know, here is Matthew 16, 27, 28, The Son of Man will come in the glory of the Father with his angels and shall reward every man according to his works. And verily I say unto you, there are some standing here, that was 2,000 years ago, folks, that shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now remember, the parallel of this in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1 literally says some standing here will not taste of death until they have seen that the kingdom of heaven, or God, having had come. In other words, some of that audience would live until Christ's coming. 
They would live through Christ's coming. They would live beyond Christ's coming in His kingdom. Isn't that remarkable? That is absolutely incredible. Now, the challenge of Christ is, did He do it? The atheists, the Muslims, the Jews, the skeptics and agnostics say, no, He didn't do it because obviously the world is still here. I've shared with you that the language of Christ coming on the clouds with a shout, with a trumpet, etc., 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 is typical Hebraic apocalyptic language. It is hyperbolic. It's exaggerated language to describe God's actions in history, not to end history. I hope, I hope that you will take the time to go back and look at the videos in which I discuss the day of the Lord from the Old Testament, how the day of the Lord is defined in the Old Testament. And you will see that beyond any shadow of a doubt, Christ's promise of His coming like the Father had come was not a prediction that He was going to come back as a physical human being, as I like to say, as a five foot five Jewish man riding on a literal cumulus cloud out of heaven as heaven and earth dissolves. Nope, it's not what the Bible predicted. So I have shared with you a good bit of time how in order to avoid that problem and in order to hang on to their literalistic concept of the coming of the Lord, people say, well, you see, the fulfillment of that prediction was the transfiguration which occurred seven days later. Matthew chapter 17. Well, without any doubt whatsoever, according to Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1, 16 and following, the transfiguration was a vision of Christ's second coming. It was not the fulfillment of it. It was a vision of that event. Now, here's what you've got to see, folks. And in our video of a couple of weeks ago, I asked you to carefully, carefully consider if and since the transfiguration was a vision of the second coming of Christ, then ask yourself the following question. If the second coming of Christ is when literal physical heaven and earth is destroyed, then shouldn't the transfiguration have been a vision of the destruction of literal, physical heaven and earth? If not, why not? If the transfiguration was a vision of the second coming, and if the second coming is the time of the resurrection of every human being who has ever lived in the history of mankind, who has gone into the grave decomposed, but is raised and reconstituted, recomposed, revived, and, you know, given life again, then since, pardon me, then since the transfiguration was a vision of the second coming, i.e. the resurrection, should not the vision of the resurrection have included the raising of dead bodies? You see, the transfiguration and what was seen does not match in any way, shape, form, or fashion what traditional eschatology describes as the day of the Lord. As I mentioned to you in the previous video that we did on the transfiguration about what was seen and what, what, what was not seen, I asked you to go there to Matthew 17 and the parallels, Mark 9 and Luke 9, and to very carefully read and to see what it was that the disciples, that the apostles actually saw when they saw the vision of the second coming. Now, let, let me remind you of this critical point, okay? There are some who want to deny that the transfiguration was a vision of the second coming. But wait a minute. The epistle of 2 Peter was written to refute the scoffers who said, where is the promise of His coming, His parousia? 2 Peter 3.3. 3. <coughs> Peter begins that, begins that epistle 
with the account of the transfiguration. And he says, Brethren, we have not, made, not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his glory, for we were with him on the mount. When such a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son. Wherefore, we have the prophetic word made more sure. For until you do well, until the day dawns in your heart. Now, look. If the transfiguration is not in any way related to the second coming, if it's not a vision of the second coming, then why would Peter say, we haven't followed cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the glory, the power and the glory of his parousia, for we were with him, we beheld his glory. Well, his glory is the parousia. We beheld his glory on the mountain. Therefore, we beheld a vision of his parousia. But again, if the transfiguration was not a vision of the parousia, why would Peter use the transfiguration to refute the scoffers who were denying the parousia? You see, Peter is using the vision of the transfiguration to refute those scoffers. But if the transfiguration had nothing to do with the transfiguration, then Peter wasn't very good in his debating and arguing. You know, as I mentioned in a previous uh, video, that would be kind of like me saying, I've got absolute proof that the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot exists. And you say, wow, Don, that's awesome. What's your proof? And my response is, hey, my proof of the scoffers who deny Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot. My proof that that is true is I drive a red Ford truck. And you would go, what? And yet that's what's being argued by some people. And it's really foolishness. There's no logic, there's no reason, there's no rhyme. The argument truly makes, doesn't even make good nonsense, much less making good sense. And what's interesting, uh, I've got to hurry here, what's interesting is that those individuals who are now saying that Peter wasn't saying that they saw a vision of the parousia, uh, the second coming, those individuals are the very individuals who tell us, you know what, uh, we, uh, church history, uh, we've got to believe church history. Church history is authoritative. What the, what the patristic writers said is authoritative. We dare not differ with the patristics. And yet the virtual united testimony of the patristic early church history writings is the transfiguration was a vision of the second coming. So on the one hand, those who reject covenant eschatology and they know, they know, listen to me, folks, they know that if the transfiguration was a vision of the second coming, they know that their concept of a future second coming is dead. Falsified. And I'll try to get to that here momentarily. So in order to escape the power and the force of the transfiguration being a vision of Christ's second coming, they say, well, you know, the word parousia, can, it can just simply mean uh uh, any kind of presence, and, and Christ's uh, ministry was his presence, or whatever. Peter wasn't saying we saw a vision of Christ's personal ministry in order to prove his second coming. Once again, that would be a rather ludicrous, illogical argument. So, when Peter said, <clears throat> we beheld his glory, we made known to you the power and the glory of his parousia. It's literally powerful 
parousia, which is glory. When Peter appeals to the transfiguration as proof positive of Christ's second coming, we need to look carefully and closely to see what it was that they actually saw in the transfiguration vision. Well, that's not hard to discern. As they went up on the mount, Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shined like the sun. His clothes shined like no, uh, no soap could ever get clothes to shine. The disciples were scared absolutely out of their mind. Well, duh, yeah, wouldn't we be? And there suddenly appeared with Jesus Moses and Elijah. Now, let me ask you a question. What did Moses and Elijah represent? Well, listen, in ancient Jewish thought, in ancient rabbinic writings, there's absolutely no question what Moses and Elijah represented, what they symbolized. They symbolized the law, the law of Moses. And that law of Moses and Elijah represented the prophets. Elijah was always considered to be the greatest of all the prophets. We have more written about Elijah in 1 Kings than we do any other prophet. You know, personally, my favorite prophetic book is Isaiah. Well, sometimes it's Malachi and sometimes it's Zephaniah. But anyway, <laughs> uh, the point being that Moses and Elijah represented the law and the prophets. Now, I want to take an ever so brief digression here. It is a digression, but it is absolutely critical to understand. In Matthew 5, 17 and 18, Jesus said, Do not think that I am come to destroy the law and the prophets. You see a train coming? I did not come to destroy, then this is what, would, what is known as an elliptical statement. In other words, Jesus did not have to say law and prophets when he said, do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. Or, I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. He didn't have to say but to fulfill the law and the prophets. It's understood. It's demanded by the context. That's what an elliptical statement is. For verily I say unto you, not one jot, not one tittle shall pass from the law, elliptical statement, or the prophets, until it is all, all what? Law and the prophets is fulfilled. Now here's what I want you to see. I will be expanding on this uh, in time to come. All right? Not one jot, not one tittle of the law of Moses would pass away until everything in the law and the prophets, remember I came not to destroy but to fulfill the law and the prophets. So the law of Moses and the old covenant prophets would not pass away until everything, every single iota or every single jot, every single tittle, you know, the dotting of the I, the crossing of a T, is fulfilled. Now here's what this means. The Old Testament, the law of Moses, predicted the second coming of Christ, the judgment, and the resurrection of the dead. I'm not going to take time right now to document that. I will at a later time when we really dig into this, okay? So, not one jot, not one tittle, not the slightest stroke of the Old Covenant would pass away until every single word of it was fulfilled. But the Old Covenant foretold the second coming, the judgment, and the resurrection. Therefore, not one single thing, not the, not the dotting of an I or the crossing of a T of the Old Covenant would pass away until the second coming, the judgment, and the resurrection were fulfilled. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, we got a problem, Houston. 
futurists, all futurist views of eschatology tell us the law of Moses passed away at the cross. Wait a minute. How could it? Not one jot, not one tittle shall pass from the law or the prophets until it is all. Not some of it, not most of it, but it is until it is all fulfilled. If you believe the law of Moses has been done away with, then of necessity you believe that the second coming, the judgment, and the resurrection have been fulfilled. I know you may go, no, 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 Preston, I don't believe that. Okay, then if they haven't been fulfilled, the law of Moses is still in effect. But I've got to hurry. Take what I just said about the passing of the law of the Moses, about the law and the prophets. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah appears with Jesus. And, you know, the apostles are stunned. And Peter says in his normally exuberant and impetuous way, Lord, it's great for us to be here. If it pleases you, let us build here three tabernacles. Now, there's something very powerful about that. That is a reference to the Feast of Sukkot. The Feast of Sukkot represented and symbolized and foreshadowed the resurrection. I mean, after all, you're seeing Moses and Elijah. Weren't they dead? Well, not really. Physically, they were, and yet here they are. But Peter is saying, Lord, it's great for us to be here. If it pleases you, let us build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And about that time, a great voice from heaven sounded. Uh, the, the Hebrew for that is the pot, bot kol, the voice from heaven. Moses and Elijah disappeared. Only Jesus was left. And the voice said, this, and in the Greek it's in the emphatic, you know, it's pointing to Jesus. This is my beloved son, him here. The emphasis is now on Jesus as the one to hear. The transfiguration was a vision of the passing of the law of Moses and the prophets. And we'll have more on that next week.